The World Wide Web didn't arrive fully formed. It wasn't delivered in a neat package with an instruction manual. Instead, it grew, piece by piece, over 30 years. It started as a simple idea in a research lab. The goal was to let scientists share documents. These documents were just text, with blue underlined links you could click. That was it. No pictures, no videos, no shopping carts. Just a way to jump from one piece of information to another. This simple concept, however, held the seed of something much bigger. It was a revolution waiting to happen, built on a series of small logical steps. This story matters because the web is now the single most important platform for software development. It runs our businesses, our social lives, our entertainment. Understanding how it was built is not just an academic exercise. It helps you understand why developers make the choices they do today. Every new framework, every new tool is an attempt to solve a problem that emerged from a previous era. The history of the web is a history of problems and their solutions. It's a story of smart people seeing a limitation and building something new to overcome it. We are going to walk through that history, milestone by milestone. Let's start at the very beginning, in the early 1990s. The first milestone was a language called HTML. It stands for Hypertext Markup Language. It wasn't a programming language like C or Java. You couldn't use it for complex calculations. Its job was much simpler. Give structure to a text document. Show simple tags for a paragraph and for a heading. By the mid-1990s, the web was growing fast. People were making personal home pages and businesses were creating their first websites. But there was a problem. The design tools were very limited. Developers were using HTML tags to control the look of their pages. They used tags like to set colors and sizes they used in visible tables to create layouts with columns. This was a messy, inefficient way to work. If you wanted to change the color of all the headings on your website, you had to go into every single page and change every single tag. It was a nightmare. The solution came in the form of CSS, which stands for Cascading Style Sheets. CSS was introduced in the mid-1990s as a way to separate a page's structure, HTML, from its presentation, style. With a single external style sheet, you could write a rule like, all headings should be blue and 24 points tall. The browser would then apply that rule to every heading on every page that linked to that style sheet. This was a massive improvement. It made websites easier to maintain and faster to load, since the styling rules could be downloaded once and reused. For users, CSS meant that websites could look much better. Designers finally had the tools to create visually appealing layouts, use custom fonts, until the late 1990s, the web was mostly a one-way street. A developer would create an HTML file, put it on a server. Users would view it. The content was static. If you wanted to update the news on your homepage, you had to manually edit the HTML file and upload it again. Every user saw the exact same page. This was fine for personal homepages, online brochures, but it was a major limitation. The web needed to become dynamic, show content that was fresh, personalized, generated on the fly. The solution was to add intelligence to the server. Instead of just serving pre-written HTML files, the server could run a program, Perl, PHP, Java. It would execute every time a user requested a page. It could check the current time, read information from a file, perform a calculation, then generate a custom HTML page and send it to the user's browser. Suddenly, websites could have dynamic content. News sites could show the latest headlines automatically. No human edits every hour. Server-side code was powerful, but it needed a place to store information. Databases arrived. A database is an organized collection of data, like a giant, super-efficient filing cabinet. The server program could connect to a database, store information, retrieve information. E-commerce sites could store product details, prices, customer orders. On a product page, the server would query the database, use the data to build the HTML page. Server-side code plus databases change the web. 
For users, sites became much more useful. Personalized greetings, content tailored to interests, interact with online stores, interact with forums. Just as web applications were hitting their stride, a new device appeared that would change everything once again, the smartphone. With the launch of the iPhone in 2007, millions of people suddenly had a powerful internet-connected computer in their pockets. They expected to be able to use the web on these new devices. But there was a big problem. Text was too small to read. Links were too close together to tap accurately. Users had to constantly pan and zoom around. The initial solution was to create separate mobile-only versions of websites. Example www.example.com for desktops and a completely different site at mbot.example.com for mobile users. This worked, but it was inefficient. You had to build and maintain two separate websites, doubling the work. Developers needed one website that worked on any screen, tiny phone to giant television. The answer was an approach called responsive web design. The idea was to use flexible proportion-based grids and a CSS feature called Media Queries. Media Queries allow a developer to apply different CSS rules based on the characteristics of the device, such as its width, height, or orientation. For example, if the screen is wider than 800 pixels, use a three-column layout. But if the screen is narrower than 800 pixels, stack the columns on top of each other into a single column. This allowed a single HTML code base to adapt its layout to provide an optimal viewing experience on any device. Responsive design was a fundamental shift in how developers approached their work. Design could no longer be a static, pixel-perfect picture. It had to be fluid and flexible. This mobile-first philosophy encouraged designers and developers to think about the most essential content and features first ensuring they worked well on a small screen, and then progressively enhancing the experience for larger screens. For users, this meant the web became truly portable. They could access information and applications anywhere, on any device, without a frustrating user experience. While frameworks were revolutionizing the front end, another major shift was happening on the back end. The old model of a single monolithic server application that handled everything User Authentication Data Processing Rendering HTML As applications grew, this single monolith became difficult to update scale, maintain a change to one small part of the system, required redeploying the entire application, which was risky and slow. A better architecture was needed for the modern, fast-paced world of web development. The solution came in two parts. APIs an API, or Application Programming Interface, is a contract that allows one piece of software to talk to another. Instead of the server generating HTML, it could expose a data API. The front-end application, built with a framework like React, could then call this API to get the data it needed. This decoupled the front-end from the back-end, allowing them to be developed, deployed, and scaled independently. This separation is the foundation of most modern web applications today. Microservices The microservices architecture takes this a step further, breaking down the monolithic backend into a collection of small, independent services. Each service is responsible for one specific business capability. For example, an e-commerce application might have a user service product service order service, each one is a small, self-contained application with its own database. They communicate with each other over the network, usually through APIs. This makes the overall system more resilient. If the product service fails, users can still manage their accounts view past orders. This new world of distributed systems was made possible by the rise of cloud computing. Services like Amazon Web Services, AWS, Google Cloud, GCP, Microsoft Azure gave developers access to virtually unlimited computing power, storage, and networking on a pay-as-you-go basis.